episode 53 of the Life in Norway show. But today we're going back to the topic from episode one. The very first guest on the Life in Norway show was Lorelou from afroginthefjord.com, the very funny chronicle of a French woman's new life in Norway. Today I welcome Lorelou back to the show to talk about her new book, A Frog in the Fjord, One Year in Norway. You can find out more information about Lorelou, her book, and everything we talk about today on the show notes page. Head on over to lifeinnorway.net slash podcast and look for episode 53. Happy listening. I'm joined today by Lorelou from afroginthefjord.com. Uh, Lorelou, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me again. Not a problem. You were, of course, the guest on the very first episode of the Life in Norway show, and you are your blog is is widely read by many of my readers. Uh, I know we 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 share an audience, uh, but the reason you're back on the show today is uh, the new book, uh, A Frog in the Fjord, which we will dive into in uh, in detail shortly. First of all, though, let's bring our audience up to speed. Um, what brought you to Norway 10, 11 years ago, and what have you been doing uh, in, in that time? Um, I came here initially on a short contract, working for an environmental NGO, and then I stayed, and, um, and now I work for the Norwegian government, um, also on environmental issues, and I also have a baby who was born last year in Norway. Congratulations. Yes. So it's been almost 12 years now. The book is out now in English and it's actually a translation of uh, a, your Norwegian version of this book, which has been released for, for many years now. So um, why now? What, why the English version so, so many years later? Actually, uh, it's not really a translation. I wrote the okay. book in English. Yeah, I wrote the book in English initially because at that time my level of Norwegian wasn't good enough for me to write a book, a whole book in Norwegian. So the the Norwegian publisher uh, Kaplandam uh, didn't want to publish that book in English, and they translated it. So actually, this book is the original version of the book, and the interesting part is that um, the Norwegians, the Norwegian publisher, wanted me to cut uh, quite a few elements of the book uh, and I put them back in. So I put back in a lot of elements of um, how I learned Norwegian language, for example, which wasn't that interesting for yeah, Norwegian natives. Uh, and also I put in a lot of other experiences because um, I traveled a lot in Norway. So I, I put back in uh, travels I made in Sørlande, in Southern Norway, for example, in the Bible Belt, uh, which Kaplanam wasn't that interested in having in the book. Um, and I put more on dating, <laughs> dating Norwegians, <laughs> which which was a hobby of mine at at the time. Um, and I think that was uh, that's kind of important when you're you're living here and you're single and it's not it's not like that easy to crack. Uh, yeah, the code is not that easy. So on that note then, um... <laughs> What, what, what is the book? It, it, it's a funny book. I'll say that first of all. It, it will make you laugh. Was it intended to be uh, a set of funny stories or are you actually trying to impart advice uh, through through the book as well? Um, the book, so my idea, I didn't want to put together blog posts from my blog and sell them because, you know, my blog is, you can read that for free. So why would anyone want to <laughs> buy a book? Um where all these stories are just put together. Um, so it's actually, it's called A Frog in the Fjord, One Year in Norway. So it's uh, through, it's going through the story of my first year in Norway. I kind of packed more experiences that have to happened to me later as well. But it's about, uh, yeah, the story of a foreigner arriving in Norway, not speaking the language, not understanding the social codes. I didn't really have that much of an idea of how Norwegian culture was, uh, working culture, um how to find an apartment how to go skiing so it's it's all about these kind of first times uh which i believe many foreigners can recognize themselves in of course it comes from my personal story so not everyone learned how to ski the same way obviously but and not everyone has been to you know i've i've traveled a lot to northern norway and to uh, the sami uh, music festival the ridu ridu and uh, yeah so it's about all 
a lot of different experiences as a newcomer, but in a, in a kind of a novel uh, form, which is uh, over a whole year. And the, the book is quite long. I mean, it's almost 300 pages. So it's um, and there are there aren't any illustrations, so it's not funny in that in that sense at least. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point that it's not just a collection of blog posts because even though your blog posts are extremely funny, I, I wish I was able to write with as much uh, comedy as as you. Um, and yet the book reads funny, and it does read like a novel. It's a, it's a story. Um, I particularly like the way it's structured. You've uh, you've split the the book essentially into the four seasons and. Uh, just to give people an idea of what they can expect, uh, some of the chapter headings. Uh, let's see, we have uh, my first Yulebor, uh, a Norwegian office, uh, Norwegian stereotypes, uh, Taco Friday, work-life balance, the cabin trip from hell. Uh, I think that should give people an idea of uh, of what to expect from this book. Uh, now, the first time we spoke uh, several years ago now uh, on the podcast, we ran through a series of your blog posts and we talked about them in detail. Uh, I'd like to do the same now with one or two chapters from the book. So um, looking back, which one of the the chapters or which one of the experiences that you write about from your first year in Norway is is the most memorable for you? Ah, oh, That's a good question. Um... So I think the first one I would dive into is um, my first Yulebud and the Norwegian office, because that was my first encounter with uh, the Norwegian working culture. And and that was kind of a shock in the positive and the negative sense. And I think it's just in a nutshell, all the cultural differences you can expect when arriving in a Norwegian office from basically any other working culture outside of Scandinavia. So from, you know, the Christmas party, the Yulebo, where people can actually get drunk, uh, colleagues and bosses, and you can basically say anything to your boss. Uh, whereas I come from a culture where that is unheard of. Um, and also uh, being in a Norwegian meeting and having all those codes, you know, social hidden codes that you don't really understand and my first meeting was uh, of course I didn't speak Norwegian and I thought everything went so well and and I told my my director oh well that went so well uh, Norway is such a peaceful country I can see it already there's no conflict and he just exploded in laughter and said there was so much conflict in that meeting the, the conclusion is that we need to have another meeting because everyone disagreed so much and just the the body language and the tone of voice of people in an office who disagree in Norway is completely different from uh, the working culture I had been used to, for example, in France or in Canada, where I used to live. So I think that's that's one of those uh, chapters. And then I think my travels, my travels in Norway. Um, I traveled uh, the whole summer um, and also in the winter to Tromsø, but the whole summer to different parts of Norway, to the Lofoten, to southern Norway, to um, the border between uh, Troms and Finnmark, um, and also to Trøndelag. And I think in those chapters, I really discovered that Norway is not just Oslo. It's not just you know, the city council and the fjord and going to Bergen to see the uh, the fish market and going to Stavanger to see Prekestolen. There's so much more to Norway. There's a variety of cultures and food experiences and languages, dialects. I mean, it's a very, very rich country. And I feel like, you know, if I had a message about this book, it would be to show exactly that, to, to remind people that Norway is just, it's not just pretty pictures, you know, of fjords, it's, and Norwegians are not all in their bunads, uh, <laughs> you know, on 17th of May with a little flag. It's actually much more complex. Uh, and on that note, actually, uh, the um, I, I try in the book to also talk about the history of Norway and why Norwegians are as we perceive them uh, from you know, our foreigners' perspective. Uh, you hear a lot. I mean, you've written many, many articles about this. Uh, you know, are Norwegians cold? Are Norwegians boring? Et cetera, et cetera. A lot of articles come out about uh, Jan Tolloven, for example. 
And so I, I, I was digging a lot. I did a lot of research for this book to actually figure out why is Jan Tullowen there? Uh, is it really what people say it is? Um, why, uh, you know, why is there the 17th of May? Why are there so many Americans with Norwegian heritage in the US? There's more than 5 million people. So all this comes from history and we, t we tend to forget that. So it was actually a very interesting experience for me to, to write this book uh, because of that. You've mentioned the 17th of May there. And uh, of course, as we record this, it's only been a week since this year's event. Um, now, related to the 17th of May, I would just like to read a very short section from the book, because um, this, this is a, a particular passage that really caught, caught my eye. Every year, at least one Scandinavian paper raises the debate of the use of the Norwegian flag during the Norwegian National Day, because here it is not just a few flags which are waved. There are literally tens of thousands of them pinned, drawn on cakes and on faces. For foreigners like me, this exaggerated use of flags was very, very strange at first, if not shocking. And you go on to talk about uh, how that uh, expression of uh, national pride is perceived differently in France. It's certainly the same in the UK, uh, perhaps the US to a certain extent too. Um, I really like this section because it reminds me of how I first thought on the 17th of May and it's experience I'd completely forgotten about. Because if I, if I walked into a march in London and everyone was waving the Union flag and they all had their face, faces painted, I would assume I was at a right-wing political rally. Exactly. Uh, and of course, very, very different in Norway. So um, have you gotten used to that? And, and a lot of these things in the book happened to you t 10, 11 years ago. So have you gotten used to these kind of things now or do you still find them strange? Well, it's funny you mentioned it because a week ago I was I was looking on Finn, you know, the the website, to, as I say, uh, where Norwegians sell just about everything uh, except sure. their soul. <laughs> and <laughs> I was I was actually looking for a bunad, and I I, I just um, I applied uh, for Norwegian citizenship, and I I thought, you know what, if I get it, I'm going to buy myself a bunad. I'm going to buy myself a traditional Norwegian dress. <laughs> so I've I've gotten definitely used to a lot of a lot of what was very surprising to me in the beginning. And, um, and I think many of the experiences I've had uh, and the conversations I've had in, in that first year helped me understand and kind of also fall in love with Norway, but also some elements I've just not rejected. I wouldn't go that far, but I still don't really agree with them. Uh, and I feel like as a foreigner, I have kind of, I've given myself the right to, just accept that I'm, you know, I'm never going to fit in 100%. And I've met Norwegians um, who don't fit in 100% either, who don't like skiing. And uh, yeah, for example. Uh, yeah, I've also found a couple of Norwegians that don't like skiing. It, it did take me several years to find them, but they, they are out there for sure. Yeah. So it's, um, I think it's a, a mix of a lot of things. Uh, as the passage you read, uh, some of these um, observations, but also stories that happened to me um, and, and how I kind of dealt with them. And I think there's a lot of frustration as well in the book because I was very frustrated in my first year in Norway. And that's also why I started writing this blog, uh, because there were so many things I didn't understand and it felt so it felt so hard, you know, it, some things just felt so difficult. Um, and for example, on Easter, my first Easter, I didn't understand. I didn't know that they would all disappear. I was alone in Oslo for like 11 days and they were all gone. And I was wondering, where are they? And they were all having fun in their cabins and skiing and eating oranges or whatever. And I, I felt a bit like abandoned. You know, why didn't anyone tell me? And uh, and then I was like, how do we go to these cabins? I didn't know any Norwegians and nobody was inviting me and I was struggling with the language and I, I was dating guys. I didn't understand the codes. So I think it's not like a happy, happy book. There are many funny situations uh, because I've been in these kind of quirky, strange <laughs> situations and also frustrations 
um, where I try to figure it out and I try to get out of it. And, and, and I think it's also because at first I thought I would only stay a year in Norway. And that's also why I wrote one year in Norway, because, you know, of course, you know, I've been here many more years. So you figure out the end of the story. But that's also the, the idea, you know, is it, is it good enough for me to stay? You know, do I find enough things, enough positive things for me to stay? I think one of the reasons I identify so much with this book is that we we moved to Norway around the same time. You, this book is set like a year, a year, maybe two years before I arrived, but more or less the same time around around 2010, uh, 2011. And a lot of the things that you experienced then are exactly the same as as what I experienced, especially some of the parts of the book that aren't necessarily funny. I, I enjoy the most as well. And that's your reflections on uh, home and and where is home. I think there's a a section towards the end of the book uh, about that. So now looking back 10 years on, 11 years on, um, is Norway home for you? It's definitely home. (laughs) It's it's hard because I still don't have any family here. I mean, I'm married and I have a baby, but we don't have, you know, that close knit of people around us, um, especially in these uh, times now with the, with the borders closed, it's, it's getting really tough because we can't get visits. Uh, we can't get help. And I know a lot of people are in this situation. Um, our families at home, some of them, some people are getting sick. I mean, it's getting really tough, but despite all that, Norway is home and I've adopted so much of the working culture, um, uh the nature you know being in nature all the time and i've written a a blog post not long ago about the real estate market which i find very irritating in norway but despite that i still live here and and i'm still looking for a house with a garden and uh and yeah i i think it's i i still find much more positive things here than i would in my original home which is my home country france uh, so I have no plan of on moving from here. Excellent. Uh, now, a question I have to ask is, uh, are you going to write another book? Is there a follow-up in the works? Well, I've, I've thought of writing about something which has become much more um, of a current theme in my life right now, which is raising children in Norway. Um, I mean, that's a whole other world of of, you know, cultural misunderstandings <laughs> and my partner is Romanian so um, we add that other layer of um, immigrant uh, immigrant element and just just a funny you know a funny story is that we send our baby he's uh, he's a bit over one year we send him to the uh, daycare with our own food and uh, and they just don't understand what we sent <laughs> seriously it's just <laughs> we have these conversations with them and they're like what is this yellow thing and it's polenta which is um corn um sure corn stew and they're like is this a fruit like what is this and and of course for us you know sending polenta and and vegetables and and fruits is it's much healthier in our mind than giving them bread and uh uh, macrelli tomate, which is this kind of uh, tomato paste with, uh, you know, leftovers from fish, and so there's so much there's so much to say on this topic uh, mm. that if I were to write another book, I, I think it would be uh, it would be on this uh, on this topic. But I, I'm not sure I would write such a long. This was a this was a heavy <laughs> this was a heavy work to write such a long book which is such a kind of complex story with uh, characters and um, yeah. So, so that was, uh, that was quite, uh, quite some work. So, so I would have to see, but I, I'd like to, to see whether we, we translate this book to other languages. So I've thought of. Sure. Uh, I, I'm sure there would be some interest in, let's say German, for instance, there's, there's so many German tourists that come to Norway. Oh and, yeah. I didn't yeah. think of German. I thought of Spanish and Polish, for example, uh, potentially French. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that's the idea for now. Um, and then we'll see. Mm. Uh, but the, the book in Norwegian sold very well. Uh, it was on the, 
a national bestseller list for a few weeks. Well, speaking uh, as a reader and a fan, if I may say so, I, I would really like to see a sequel about uh, becoming Norwegian, given that you are in the process of applying for citizenship, as you said earlier. I think that would be a, a, an equally funny and yet also interesting uh, tale. And, and and now, of course, you're having a uh, you've had a child in Norway as well, and that's a uh, and and. There's just a lot of very interesting uh, topics there, I think, 10 years on that, that you can Absolutely. reflect on. So. Yeah. And my Norwegian is much better now, too, so I can follow, you know, politics. And, and I, now I'm hoping to be Norwegian before the election. So that ah, I so can you can vote. vote. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, there's uh, some very interesting uh, set of elections coming up later this year, but uh, exactly. that's definitely the topic for another show, I think. <laughs> So, Laura Lou, this this book you said is three, 350 pages, something like that. It's full of advice as well as a lot of jokes. It's full of advice for people moving to Norway. But what is one piece of advice that you would give someone that's about to move to Norway today that they really must know? And, you know, there's so much practical advice out there on, on websites like Life in Norway. But w- what about uh, a, a really useful piece of advice from someone who's been here, lived here, done it? I think an advice I would give is not to have um, too much of a stereotype of what, you know, who Norwegians are and how Norwegians are and what Norwegians do, because there are many, many kinds of Norwegians and there are many kinds of people here and there are many groups of people. So when I hear, uh, oh, but Norwegians are hard to make friends with and this and that, and I feel like it's not that simple. You know, nothing is that simple. So keep an open mind. I know that sounds a bit cliche, but keep an open mind. Try to learn Norwegian uh, and be very extrovert. Unfortunately, that's how you do it. That's how I made it. Uh, I just invited people over. Uh, I just, you know, come over for dinner. And Norwegians are like anyone else. If you invite them for dinner, they're really happy. Uh, if you invite them for a picnic, they're really happy. And um and it's funny because my my closest friend, who is still my friend now and, and whom I met in my first year, and she's in the book, uh, I changed all the names. So her name is Kaya in the book. And she arrived from Trøndelag at the same time I came from abroad. And she didn't have any friends in Oslo either, although she was Norwegian. And we kind of stuck together also because of that. Uh, so so just, yeah, keep an open mind and, and don't be too... Um, too you know, complaining and nobody, as I, I say, if you're in your own country and you hear someone, anyone complaining about your country, you're not, that's not really attractive. Um, but just on one uh, topic, which uh, is uh, also very important in the book, which is dating. I think there, there are many pieces of advice there <laughs> to date a Norwegian. And, um, and that's, that's, that was quite tough. Uh, and I have a few chapters such as how to seduce a Norwegian, for example, um, or surviving winter, which has a lot to do with <laughs> how to seduce a Norwegian. <laughs> um, <laughs> and also about being a woman in Norway, which can be a very different experience from being a woman uh, in, in other countries, I think. And that's also one of the reasons I really like living in Norway is that, for example, you have a lot of uh, women in leadership and they have children and, you know, it's just possible. It it just works. Um, So that's really encouraging for me, at least. I think it's curious that both of us, we came to Norway single and we've both ended up (laughs) with uh, fellow foreign citizens as as partners. I wonder exactly. if that says anything about the, the dating scene. In the <laughs> yes, <world>. exactly. <laughs> Apparently, it's even worse with the coronavirus because everyone is on these dating apps, but they can't really meet. They feel bad about meeting because they have, you know, people in their family who are in risk groups. So it, it's becoming really complicated. Um I want to ask you a little about uh, raising a child uh, in Oslo in, in 2021. Obviously, we can't talk about this without um, mentioning coronavirus because that is the backdrop. So it's hard to ask you about your experiences um, raising a child in Oslo because really the the virus has kind of taken precedent. It must have affected every aspect of 
uh, having the child from from pregnancy and then everything through to now. Now the child's attending Barnhager. So what has it been like this last year uh, in Oslo? I think like on the positive side, um, we've spent a lot of time with our child <laughs> because of course, yeah. because because we were um, working from we're working from home, both of us. And the uh, daycares have uh, limited uh, opening hours because of Corona. So we're spending a lot of time with him, much more than, than we would have spent in a normal year. Uh, also, as soon as there is a suspicion of um, someone being infected at the Barnahage, they, they close everything for 10 days. So, I mean, our child is what they call the, you know, Corona babies. I don't know what's going to happen with them, but he's a very happy child. And that kind of makes me feel good about the fact that at least despite all this mess, uh, we've had this time, privileged time with him. But of course, on the negative side, we're kind of exhausted because we have uh, zero help. Uh, our families cannot come and visit. We cannot go and visit our families. Uh, it's also, you know, psychologically and emotionally difficult because he's not meeting his grandparents. Mm. And uh, and that's really tough. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, I think, for many foreigners with children right now. In Norway, uh, interesting two sides of the coin there. Uh, I hadn't really, really considered. I'm, I'm child, childless, so uh, yeah, the, it's very interesting to hear that perspective. Um, the book, Laura Lou, it's called "A Frog in the Fjord: One Year in Norway." It's available uh, from Amazon, and hopefully, by the time you hear this, from other places as well. Uh, where can people find the book? I guess you have uh, written about it on on your website. Yes, yeah, so you can find it in any Amazon. Uh, so Amazon US, France, Italy, Great Britain, Germany, etc. Um, and it's also available in Scandinavia if you want to pay much less or free uh, shipping uh, on Adlibris and Book Depository. I hope to I hope to have it in Norley and uh, different uh, bookstores soon. Excellent. Now, before we go, Laura Lou, I will ask you the three standard questions I ask every guest on the Life in Norway show. I can't remember if we did this in episode one. Um, I, re- I really don't recall, but it'll be interesting to look back and see if your answers are still the same if, if we did. So just some quick answers from you, please. Uh, what's the best thing about living in Norway? I think it's the clean water and clean air, <laughs> I would say. And what's the most challenging or frustrating thing? The way people, especially in the south of Norway, handle conflict, I think is challenging for me. I think I'm going to have to ask you to elaborate on that. I'm really intrigued. <laughs> um, I talk about it in my book, actually. I think okay. it's uh, it, I think it's hard to read people and to always um, keep you know, I, I tend to be very passionate when I talk about things and, and a lot of Norwegians read that as a conflict, conflict oriented mm. and aggressive. And and that happens to me only in Southern Norway. In Northern Norway, they, they just think it's fun. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> Okay. And finally, uh, your favorite place in Norway. Uh, so my favorite place uh, in Norway, I would say is uh, an island um, not far from uh, Tromsø in the north called uh, Høya which has a very uh, particular uh, rock on it, p- very particular shape, which inspired the ice cathedral in uh, Tromsø. And uh, that place is just magical. There's like white sand beaches and uh, turquoise uh, water. And it's just so peaceful. I mean, I I would love to buy a house there and I don't know, <laughs> go fishing every day or something. <laughs> Laura Lee, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we've talked about the book, of course, which is called A Frog in the Fjord, One Year in Norway. Uh, but where can people find more of your writing online? Uh, well, you have my blog, frogginthefjord.com, where I write in English. Um, I also have a monthly column in uh, VG, the very big uh, Norwegian newspaper. And oh, you're I... still writing there? Yes, I am. Um, so I write in Norwegian there. And then I also hold a lot of workshops on uh, how to work in Norway with Norwegians. Uh, I do that uh, for universities uh, in Oslo. And I also work full time. So it's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
it's kind of a, a balance there to uh yeah and to, a one-year-old as well and, and a one-year-old yes <laughs> Laurelie, thanks so much for uh, the chat and best wishes for the book launch. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks for inviting me. 